Okay, we'll come back into a uh, session from our break. So we have, let's see, Marie and Michelle. Good morning, Hesquax. Hesquax, Kisio Kukit, Hesia. This morning, I would like to uh, introduce Tribal Council to three of our conservators that we have been working with uh, for Three Chiefs Cultural Center for the restoration of um, paintings and artifacts and photographs that were damaged in the fire of the People Center September 2020. And, and I'm not sure what order we're going to go in, but um, I will go ahead and introduce Nancy Bonicello. She's the lead conservator, and she is from Ancient Artways Conservation LLC out of Wilsall, Montana. So, um, and they'll just go one after the other and, and give their presentations to you on the work that they have completed and are doing still for three chiefs. And then I will just be sitting on the side, just answering questions if I need to. So thank you for your time today. And um, Nancy, would you like to begin? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, I thought I would try a screen share of a PowerPoint presentation. So let me know if this works. This is kind of new to me. Uh, let's see, try that one. Okay, um, can you see that PowerPoint? I can't. Yes, we can see it, Nancy. Okay, um, there we go. So what I thought I would do is I'd give you an overview of our progress. Um, there's a lot of different aspects to the collection, obviously, so we hired uh, several different conservators who are experts in their field. No one conservator can treat everything because we have cultural objects and natural history and photographs and paintings and furniture. So I thought I would just give you a really brief overview of what's going on um, and our current progress. And then I'll turn it over to the other two conservators and they can talk about their part. Um, one of the first things to be finished was the furniture conservation. We contracted with Mr. Jack Lyons out of Great Falls to treat the uh, church pew that is, um, from what I understand, the sole survivor of the uh, Jaco church. Um, as you can see, it was heavily damaged with smoke and also heat. You can see the varnish that's bubbled on the right side there. And Jack was successfully able to uh, treat the objects and do some repairs. And there's his uh, progress that's on display in the center right now. He was able to re redo the shellac and the finish repair all the smoke damage. And he also made some repairs to uh, one of the arms that was broken loose. And um, so, and he gets an A for being first because he finished his Nancy, project. Nancy, sorry, we can't see the images that you are talking about. Oh, um, it says I just, are screen sharing. Yeah, I just see the main um, PowerPoint page in the, like the first, the first oh, slide. Thank you letting me know, because I have to be the guinea pig on this. Let me stop my share. You just need to click on the next slide. Yeah, I'm going actually through the slides. You're not able to see them. And yeah. I mean, sorry about that. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure how to get out of that either. So what do you, do you see this? No, we just see you for now. Okay. Let me try another screen share. Sorry about that. Right. Okay, now we're on the furniture conservation first slide. Okay, can you see the slides changing now? No. Yeah, I'm not sure what to do. I don't want to take up your time by um, with this, uh, technical stuff. So what I think I should probably do is just go through and um, the, most of these pictures are in my report. Um, that I've already submitted. So is that, would that be the best way to proceed so as we don't uh, waste anyone's time? Yeah, Nancy, you can go ahead and proceed with your report and then um, we'll make sure council has a complete copy of each report. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I'm not sure what else to do. So I had some great pictures for you, but anyway, so the furniture conservation was done first and um, my part of the project was the cultural objects. Um, and there was about uh, 200 objects recovered from the fire, about 140 of them we decided 
use conservation treatment, um, and a hundred of those uh, needed professional conservation treatment in my lab. And that's what I started working with. Um, uh, sorry, I'm so um, these objects are complex because they have many different types of materials in them, silk and beadwork and leather. And um, so we were successfully able to um, treat all the different object types. I took uh, a set first off, uh, I took about 13 objects that represented all the different object types in the collection. And um, so we could set the treatment protocols and see what would work. So we've done textiles and we've done feathers and we've done some examples of beadwork and all these will be in the images that I can forward to you. My apologies for not getting the PowerPoint to work because um, I had examples of all these to show you. Um, we will make sure you get a copy. Um, and then in addition to the work that I've been doing in my studio here, um, we've also done some work with the staff at the center and they've been treating objects there that needed light cleaning or light repairs. So we did some Zoom sessions, some online training and um, we have a number of objects that were treated. I think there was about 40 objects that were treated in-house there on site. And uh, most of those are out of play in the museum now. And so it was a good thing. Um, the natural history collection was another part of the, uh, my responsibility. There's a number of mammal taxidermy mounts, Alaska grizzly bear, and uh, several other objects, um, including some bird mounts. So this summer, I was able to do some experimental treatments on the grizzly bear, and he's quite large, obviously, and he's over in the um, kicking horse warehouse. Um, and um, I was able to, I treated him for about five days and I got quite a bit done. I expect he's gonna take another maybe 10 days to two weeks of treatment. And I expect to do that over the rest of the summer. Um, and he should be done by the fall. Um, the bird mounts are another problem entirely in that they were severely damaged by smoke and also by water from the fire suppression efforts. My first instinct was to just declare them a loss and try to replace them. But because of federal feather law and endangered species act, there's little chance that we could actually replace them because they simply don't exist. So we want to be able to see if we can treat them. One of the problems with the birds is that um, bird mounts from up until about the 1970s, the taxidermy mounts, were very often treated with pesticides. And we need to decide, we need to determine if they have pesticides in them and that mostly arsenic and mercury that could pose a health hazard to anyone handling or treating them. Once we know that, then we can determine whether or not we're gonna treat them, where we're gonna treat them and about how much time it's gonna take and how much it will cost. So I expect to be able to do that analysis um, probably in the spring. We have to rent an X-ray um, spectrometer uh, and in order to be able to test that. And as soon as we know that, we'll let you know. And then the other thing that I um, just wanted to give you was an overall timeline. Pretty much we're on track with our schedule that we put together last January. The paintings are finished, um, thanks to Joe, and the furniture is finished. My work is in progress. The cultural objects to be done probably by the end of the year, into the spring, maybe for some of the more difficult ones. Uh, the taxidermy mounts should be done by the end of the year. And the bird mounts is, um, the jury's still out on that. And as soon as we know what the status of the pesticides are, we'll let you know. In terms of the big picture, um, the way forward, what we're really looking at is, um, the real need to have a storage area, a secure storage area that will have enough space so that as we're bringing objects back for treatment, we have adequate space to store them. Right now we have um, storage space pretty limited at um, nine pipes and uh, they're very gracious to give us the space. Um, but we really need more space. The stuff's coming back, they'll be in their own boxes and stuff. So that's what I had. Again, my apologies for not getting the PowerPoint to work, but I will make sure everyone gets a copy. And I'll turn it over to whoever wants to speak next. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Um, Joe or Jennifer, who wants to go next? Joe, you're on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I would go. Okay, thanks. Well, good morning, um, Chairman McDonald and council members. My name is Joe Brusha. I am an art conservator out of Kalispell, Montana. I specialize in uh, oil paintings uh, uh, and paintings in general. Um, and I was contacted by Nancy um, to, to do to this project. Um, and I'll, I'm going to switch over to my um, 
PowerPoint, uh, show my desktop so we can go through some stuff. I, I, I was able to finish up all, all the paintings and uh, I'd like to share with you this morning um, how those turned out. So I'm gonna, it's my first time doing Zoom, so bear with me, but I, I think we can do it here and uh, we're gonna click over. And then... All right, so I'm just gonna uh, start going through a few of these. And uh, um, I originally came and picked up um, nine paintings um, to t take to my studio to test and see the amount of damage and, and what we would be able to um, restore and help with this project. Um, the first four I'd like to go through, um, they were all the same size. It, it's the portraits um, and they were all uh, 24 by 30s. And they, I guess I, they were hanging on the rotunda up, up top. Um, when I received them, they, you can see in the first picture here, they all, unfortunately due to the fire, they all you know, received some burning and, and uh, some soot um, damage. Um, they also received some moisture damage from when uh, the fire was being put out. And uh, also uh, these first four, especially um, the frames, uh, they fell off the wall. So they really damaged the frames up quite a bit. Um, to the left here, you just see an after. This is, um, we did decide to go with some new custom built frames for the pieces um, and stuff. Uh, but let me show you a little process. This is uh, the next slide here. This is the first one here is the, the before, and you can see how um, this is the stretcher bar supports that support the canvas. Those were all heavily damaged also. The backs also, we had a lot of sooting and burning. So uh, we, we decided to do a full restoration on these, which um, the process, and, and it was pretty much the same process through um, all eight of the pieces. Um, uh, the, the first thing we did was I, I took everything out, out of the, the, the burnt, burnt, uh, bars and stuff, removed the, the canvas from the bars, um, cleaned the canvas front and back. And then after that, there was about a six months process of reducing the, um, the, the smoke, uh, the smell from that. So that was done with various processes of either absorbing some of the smell with uh, uh, um, different chemicals, and then also just a, a long uh, extended air out process where we thoroughly, uh, I had a room that was very well ventilated and, and we were able to uh, uh, provide a lot of fresh air to, to reduce that down. I think we reduced it down really well, um, which was fortunate. And then the second picture here, this would be um, um, the canvas after it was relined, we put a new canvas onto the back of the old canvas. Um, that helps in the longevity of the canvas with some of the water damage, what can occur later years from now down the road, you could loosen up some paint and have some cracking. So we felt like, uh, um, in order to put it on new bars and also to have the longevity of the piece that we would reline these pieces. So this is relining. You can see the back of the new canvas. It's stretched on, on new, new stretcher bars. And also these, these would be called the stretcher bar keys. These are um, stuck in the bars to where a canvas is constantly stretching, expanding over time. And these are just there to help um, readjust the tension of the canvas. Um, and then here it is, they are all finished. Um, I did install a backing board. This is a protective measure. Um, it's pretty standard on museums. What, what it does, it helps with the longevity of the piece. It keeps dirt and grime from going um, in back of the painting and, and in between your bars. And it also helps stabilize this environment. So you don't have as much stretching and, and expanding uh, of the thing. So I think this is going to be a really good thing for the, for, for the future uh, of the pieces. So this is an example of all four, and I'll, I'll just go through. I didn't show all four of the backs, but this is what happened to each of them. And then here are some more before and after photos. 
Um, this would be the second one. There also, um, what we had to do, there were some uh, little um, uh, scratches and different things to the paint surface. So I did go in and, and touch these up, as you can see over here. Um, you can see in this one particularly too, um, how much soot and grime did co come off. So I was happy we were able to um, brighten these up quite a bit. Um, unfortunately, in, in fire situations, um, depending on how much heat the piece received, um, depends on, you know, how much you can actually get off there that's not baked in. So I was, we're, we're pretty pleased with uh, uh, the way that came out. Um, and here would be the third one. Same thing uh, before and after um, of the pieces. And then this would be the fourth one, the big portrait. And, uh, and, and there's the finished of that. Um, another piece we did, this was a, a fairly large piece. It was not framed. Um, it did have, you can see along the sides, it was sitting stacked somewhere. And, and this is a, a layer of soot, the dark soot that came on here and also in here and here. We were, I was able to reduce it quite a bit uh, um, in the painting. Some of it, I, I couldn't get off just because of that heat factor. And there was some over in here, this area here, you see some darkening that was actually caused by excess amount of heat to the piece. Um, I, I, it looked like it received some heat on the front and the back of it. Um, so this is the before, this is the after. Um, the back of it, um, it was basically the same procedure. We, we surfaced, this one we did not line. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, this one we did not line. Um, it didn't need to be relined, um, but we did. Uh, there, there. These are um, brace bars for such a big canvas. This just helps tension the bars. It was adhered with uh, plastic um, um, holders that actually had melted and uh, caused the bars to to come loose and the whole painting to sag and stuff. Also, you can see it never had the stretcher bar keys, so the canvas had loosened up. So the restoration process on this particular piece. I cleaned as much of the certain grime off the front and the back. And then we, we took the new bars. I re-adhered them to the back to stabilize the canvas. And then I also added some new stretcher bar keys and was able to adjust the canvas so it tightened up really nice. And then again, with the protective measures and for future down the road, I installed a backing board on this piece. And like I said, that helps stabilize the piece. It also um, helps keep dirt, grime, or anybody from, you know, knocking into the back, causing a whole future damage. Um, the next piece, this was a small piece, a little small eight by 10 uh, canvas. It was in pretty poor shape. It had received from some damage from the, um, from the fire. Um, it was an older piece. And it had some pre-existing conditions also. Um, it had a few <clears throat> little rips and dings to it. Um, so the, the, we, we decided on this one, I lost my tracking. Oh, on this one that we would reline it um, and also get a frame for it. So I was really happy. We were able to clean this up quite a bit. Um, I'll show you the next. Next shot, this would be the before. And you can see some of the water damage and staining on this also. And, and here's the back uh, of some of the rips. Um, the, the lining on this one actually, you know, helps stabilize these rips so they, they can't get any further. And then we will stabilize the paint with any future damage that some of this water damage could have caused. So here it is on the new bars. Um, it has the stretcher bar keys to help tighten it. And then we have it again in the frame and um, with, with the backing board on it for future protection. Um, but yeah, I was very, very pleased with this one. It really cleaned up really nice. We were able to get a lot of dirt and grime off there. It was kind of interesting. There was a, a signature uh, uh, in, in here that was uh, uh, of the piece, but it was also, there was another signature up in here that we really couldn't see. And that was a signature of the, uh, of the actual artist that did the piece. So you can see it over in the clean. So that was kind of neat to, to discover that that was still in there. Um, um, this was another piece. Uh, this one, um, 
did not need a relining, but it, this was one of the, the, a piece that had a lot more uh, uh, soot on it than any of the other piece. It was really in a heavily sooted area. Um, and uh, anyway, we were, we were able to clean, clean that soot layer off and, and brighten it back up. And then the frame, these were all too far gone. And, and, and with all the smoke damage and stuff, it's really difficult to get that smoke. So we decided to replace the frames and, and we could also have, so the whole collection is, is kind of framed the same. Um, so here's a, oh, I don't have a back shot of that one because we never did do any of the bars. Um, there was um, one of the last pieces um, this one had received very heavily smoke and grime and actually got pretty hot. And you can see over here how some stuff kind of melted, some of the varnish melted and burnt in. Um, I was able to clean it off quite a bit, uh, reduce this, this uh, soot layer here. And it also actually had from some water damage where um, there was some paper and stuff stuck to it, but we were able to clean that off and restore it. And we were actually to brighten the painting up quite a bit. So I was really happy with uh, um, how that one um, ended up turning out, I think. Oh, here's the back of it. And you can see this one too, heavily water stained. Um, um, so we took it out of there. I took it off this one. We did reline, um, reasoning behind that was, uh, a lot of due to the water stain and future of the piece to, to help it, um, be stable for years to come. And then, uh, the backing board and then in a new frame, um, uh, there was one other piece that I did take to my shop to test. Unfortunately, um, it had a little bit too much heat to the paint layer where the, the soot and grime actually burnt into the paint layer. And unfortunately, there's nothing I can do to bring that back because the damage is just uh, beyond, beyond uh, repair. Um, the, the other thing we, we did, and uh, these were uh, some strong boxes. Um, since the paintings weren't going to be hung right away and we don't know where they're going to be going in the future, this was something I suggested um, for the collection and they're called strong boxes and they're specifically designed to house um, artifacts and, and, and paintings. Um, um, they're, they're puncture resistant. And so these will be very good to, to store your paintings in until you get them hung um, in their new locations, or even down the road, let's say you're, you need to paint a wall or something. These are great places to put your paintings just to make sure they're safe um, when they're moved or anything else. So I think this really um, adds a lot to the collection. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's been an honor working on this job. And I'd also like to thank uh, Nancy for supervising. She's, she did a great job and uh, really made uh, my job a lot simpler. So thank you, Nancy, for, for all that you've done. And uh, I think that's about it. Thank you, sure. Joe. Awesome. Um, we can move right on to Jennifer. Hi everyone, thank you for inviting me today. And uh, you know, I'm really excited to be working on this project for you and learning a lot about your culture and happy to present our progress to you today. So I'll just pull that up and share my screen. Um, so my name is Jennifer McGlinchey Sexton. I'm a photo conservator based in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, and believe it or not, that's the closest photo conservator to you guys. Um, Nancy reached out to me and I'm, um, I've been really enjoying working with her on this project. I have a team. This is for me, this is one of the largest projects I've ever worked on. So I couldn't do it without my team. So I have a conservation technician and a photographer who's helping me with the digitizing, um, both also based here in Colorado. Um, so just to give you sort of an update of our progress, we're still very much in progress. Um, center to pick up and bring back to my studio. Um, I think that was an undercount because um, so far 
we've uh, cataloged more than 2,200, um, which have been cataloged and photographed. And so one of the things that we're doing as part of our process, but also to help with um, when the items go back to the museum and help give Marie all the data that we have is creating this custom database to keep track of the items, their numbers, their photographs, and the treatment they receive from us. Um, and so um, there was a large collection of negatives that we've been working to digitize and scan. So more than 1,600 of those have already been done, but there are quite a few left. Uh, we have completed more than 145 individual treatments of photographs. Um, there are many more of that in progress. In the beginning, I um, set it up in three phases. So our first phase was dealing with things that were still wet. Um, Marie had found some negatives that were still frozen that we uh, defrosted and treated. Um, things that had mold, uh, mold can grow anytime things get wet um, and they're in the right environment. And so obviously a result of the fire, mold is a secondary issue. Um, and then things that had other unstable things in, in my conservation opinion, which would be tape or um, like tears or broken glass, for example. And so that phase has been completed and at least 90 of those items were uh, returned to 3 Tooth Cultural Center this summer. And uh, we're sort of well into phase two, but we haven't reached phase three yet. Uh, an important part for me was incorporating training for the Three Chiefs Cultural Center staff, like Nancy was mentioning, so that things can be done in-house. Uh, so just an example of digitizing the negatives, you know, some of them, you know, were salvaged from the fire. So when I, when I got them, they were kind of, you know, in this um, sort of... Um, chaotic arrangement. And so we've been working slowly through those. So they get scanned, rehoused and cataloged. And so here's some just more examples. And the rehousing is, is a really important thing from my point of view. So the negatives come back to the museum in, in a stable way and they can be um, tracked and put into more stable archival housings, um, which some of them were not in before. Um, and so this sort of helps improve their housing, but you can see there is still some damage that we're not able to repair from, from the fire. So there's distortions in the negatives and then some image loss, of course. And we're doing our best to kind of preserve what's there, but we're not reconstructing any image details that have been lost. Um, when I first came to um, pick up the photographs, one of the things we looked at were these group of elder photographs that weren't really the photographs weren't damaged, but the framing was. And so this is what, and I photographed them, I think this was out of Kicking Horse. And so when I came back to Montana this summer, I worked with Jerry to help you know, and Nancy, thank you, Nancy, for helping too. Uh, basically, we matted and framed all of these photographs. So taking them out, well, Jerry had already taken them out of the old frames. And then the idea was that we could reduce sort of the smell and some of the damage that was happening by actually just re removing the frames and the matting material. So they all got new archival matting materials and UV filtering glazing. Um, Nancy and, and Jerry did try to restore these frames by cleaning the soot off, but unfortunately they were just too badly damaged. So the next phase will be getting new frames. Here's Jerry holding one, one of the ones that we reframed with, in, with a cleaned frame, but it's very, the, the frame really should be replaced. But for the interim, um, we did reframe three photographs so they could be hung back in the museum. And then as far as the treatments go, you know, a lot of what Nancy and uh, Joe have mentioned is very similar to what we do um, and our, our goals. So we're trying to deal with um, soot that's been deposited on items and then obviously uh, trying to minimize the smell. This example um, is 
a photograph that stuck to glass. And so early on, Marie and I had some discussions about what to do with this kind of problem. From a conservation point of view, it's um, usually not very successful to remove them from the glass. And so we decided early on that the goal would be to clean the glass so that the image could be photographed to, to preserve the image itself. And so that's an example here where just the glass is being cleaned, but the photograph is actually still stuck to the glass. So it'll come back to you that way um, with a, like maybe a more um, robust housing so that the glass doesn't break because um, the glass does break often. And so I found quite a few examples of this specific image so far uh, in the collection. So the one on the left, that is a later print. And this one's completely stuck to the glass as well, but this glass is then broken. So it's sort of another level of complexity to have that in the collection. Um, and so, you know, ultimately Marie will have to decide, you know, how that's dealt with, but we're preserving sort of the image as it is. And it, it's interesting to me to see this photograph itself repeated many times in the collection. And I think both this example and the one I showed you before are much later prints. And we found a rolled pho photograph that I think is closer to the original date that is in much better condition. So on the right, you can see, we still can't unroll it completely because it's in treatment, but I think it's actually probably not only a better representation of the image, and in better condition, but closer to the original date and has the photographer's stamp on it. Well, that's all I have and thank you. I'm gonna stop my share. Let me know if you have questions and I know Marie can answer a lot of them as well. Thank you so much, um, all, all of you guys for your presentation, Martha, are I look at Martha, Joe, Nancy, and Jennifer. I appreciate everything that you guys have done to help us um, with these collections. Are there any questions from council? Um, <clears throat> yeah, boy, great work. I really appreciate it. And Joe, you know, I've worked with your wife for quite a few years and she never mentioned to me that she was married to such a talented uh, <laughs> person. So um, yeah, wow. Oh, thank you. Great thank work. you so much. And uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. And, and uh, thank you all for that presentation. I, I truly appreciate the work that you've done and uh, by preserving um, these, these relics that we, that we could have lost. You know, I'm, I'm very, very um, appreciative of that. One of the questions I have is, is um, <clears throat> Do you, do you guys have experience in working on um, animal mounts, restoring animal mounts? And the reason why I, ask, reason why I bring that up is um, we were discussing on, on bringing back big medicine. And we know that there were some issues on transporting but um, I wonder if this is, um, this would be the, the ideal time to engage again with, the, with these contractors to help us out with that. Um, if I might speak, I have something to offer. Um, I ha have done some work for Montana Historical Society and um, they asked me about Big Medicine and I haven't seen him He's the uh, white buffalo that's on display there. So they did ask me about that. And um, so, but I didn't want to be involved directly with the project unless, uh, because I'm under contract with you folks, unless there's, I want to be sure there's no conflict of interest. It was simply a scientific assessment of the taxidermy mount. So I have some experience with that. But they also have a taxidermist that could evaluate the amount. He's quite old. And I, I forget when he was mounted, 1939 or something like that. Um, so there was some concern about moving in, but um, so that's, uh, I, I know a little bit about it, but if I can help in any way and um, just provide some input, completely scientific, you know, you can be moved, you can't be moved. Here's why one of the big concerns I think as a conservator is um, where he would be put on display, we would need some kind of climate control to make sure that he's preserved. So I don't know um, 
what your plans are for um, where he would be displayed. That would be one of the big concerns that the, um, as a conservator, we would have. So anyway, that's what I wanted to offer. If I can help in any way, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Nancy. Um, actually, your name came up before when we were talking about um, <laughs> bringing big medicine back. Um, but that would be one of the considerations is that we want to build the facility for him to come back. And that would be one of our eloquent arguments to bring him home was that we would have a better facility for him to be displayed that that our, our tribal nations could, could look at him and, and visitors could see him. Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Michelle and Marie and Everyone else, um, yeah, that's this is amazing to to watch this um, transformation from you know being inside there that that day after. Um, I honestly didn't think there was going to be much of anything uh, preserved or even the chance of restoration on any of it. So um, I appreciate you know all the hard work, especially the staff. Um, you know. I hope that we're getting to, to a place of closure with all of this. And I think, you know, this is the last step. So I, I appreciate all the, the hard work and continued hard work. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to find three chiefs a home and, and have it be everything that, you know, the people center once was and hopefully much better as well. So thank you guys. Jennifer. Thank you, Chairman McDonald. I, I just think all of you did a really good job restoring these really important pieces to our tribe. So thank you very much um, for making it possible for generations to come to enjoy those. Also wanted to say thank you, Three Chiefs, for my really nice mug that you gave me. And um, yeah, so thank you so much. And I, you know, look forward to enjoying those. And I just, I'm new and I just wanted to ask, I don't know if this is the right time, but where where is three chiefs going to relocate ideally um they ha are you still deciding that yeah <laughs> we are um actually we uh, michelle and i met with uh, patricia hibbler this morning and discussed um you know i guess what we discussed was uh the process to move forward on that and that's where we're at right now so there's not been a definite decision yet thank you for the presentation that's beautiful work um i can't imagine the detail and, and countless hours you had to uh spend on this but your your craft your your artistry is is very appreciative for mm -hmm. keeping our keepsakes um available to us so thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah. Thank you all for your time. I wish you could have seen Nancy's PowerPoint. Um, and I'm sure that she'll send it on to you guys so that you can see the amazing work that was done to restore um, the, you know, the saddle, the buckskin and beadwork gloves and saddle drapes and everything else that she's already completed and brought home. So um, but thank you guys for your time. And um, um, grateful to our conservators for all of their hard and hard work and expertise. So have a good day, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will now move on to our next agenda item, which is legal department, Dan. Uh, morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, Council Members. Uh, yeah, great presentation there just ahead of us here. Um, looks like they did some wonderful work. So definitely uh, encouraged by that. So uh, we do have a number of updates for the Council today. Our first two will be in open session. And is John, are you on, John Harrison? I'm here. And uh, hey. Martin, I think Carrie uh, is in the waiting room as well. She was going to join me on this.
Cool. Thanks, Carrie. <laughs> uh, so, good morning, Council. Um, uh, and I appreciate. I also have to appreciate Jen for squeezing me in on <laughs> a couple uh, things. We got a, a, a time-sensitive uh, comment letter uh, that we wanted to, to get. So, uh, Carrie developed a very good letter. Uh, it regards the um, Northern Continental Divide ecosystem grizzly bears and the uh, proposed arm, administrative rules of Montana arm change uh, to uh, uh, deal with uh, or prepare for a possible delisting. You know that the state has a, a request to, uh, to delist the grizzly bear. And uh, this would be something that was facilitate state management, um, this arm change. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Commission uh, will be taking it up. Comments are due on Friday. So um, uh, we've talked internally and uh, I think Kerry developed a very good uh, letter. And this is, these would be the comments uh, if the council approves. We're looking for uh, council consensus to submit these comments to the Fish and Wildlife Commission uh, regarding the proposed arm change uh, for NCDE grizzly bear management. And I'll defer to Carrie if she's got any thoughts on this, and she can certainly answer any any questions. She's an expert on this and and has really tracked this stuff. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, I guess uh, kind of just a brief overview of what the arm rule um, is. So the conservation strategy, uh, which was kind of updated and amended in 2019, I believe, um, is sort of a uh, when or, you know, hopefully when, but if grizzly bears are delisted, the conservation strategy uh, which uh, we're kind of signed on to as a partner in that, I believe that uh, pretty much just governs how grizzly bears in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem would be managed in order to, um, you know, continue um, successful recovery and uh, make sure that they're monitored appropriately to be able to ensure that, you know, their, their populations will sustain. And so um, this arms rule, arms rule here was essentially uh, a legal document that took the conservation strategy and made it a regulatory um, document or a regulatory plan. And so um, the arms rule, I'm not sure when it was initially kind of created, but these proposed changes are um, uh, not changing anything specific from the original conservation strategy that was agreed upon. But again, kind of these changes are highlighting um, you know, the including specific, lang specific language for hunting, if hunting were to be used as a tool to, you know, manage the populations in the future. And then, um, so we do want to, uh, felt that it was prudent to address that here, um, because when, you know, in the past we had made statements of um, opposing the sport hunting um, of grizzly bears. So we wanted to kind of just reinstate that comment. And then the only other um, kind of um, and then you can see here, there was some specific, uh, during the hearing last, I believe Tuesday, um, there was kind of some suggestions to kind of tighten up or amend the language that uh, was proposed in the arms rule that and you can see kind of here on that item number um, five, where the scratched out wording, you know, um, it's, be, or it was pro proposed at the meeting that that and be changed to an or and that the exceeded be changed to reached just to sort of um, kind of help I think clarify when some of the um, uh, mortality threshold limitations would kick in um, for that year. Uh, and so if there are any questions on that, um, you know, I can uh, try to uh, go through that as well. But then the last piece in the letter talks about, so another thing in this arms rule um, change is that they're just making explicit that when grizzly bears are moved from the NCDE and used to augment the cabinet yak or the um, greater Yellowstone ecosystem grizzly bear populations that um, 
I mean, they're already that those programs are written already in the conservation strategy, but this these changes are just making it explicit that when bears are moved from the NCDE to these other ecosystems, that they do count as mortalities in the NCDE um, towards that total threshold. But um, I did want to just kind of emphasize that, you know, we do support that genetic or that natural genetic connectivity between these recovery zones as well as augmentation. Um, because, you know, my concern with that was that, you know, if, um, you know, we can show that we can keep moving gene um, genetic kind of viability through these populations by physically moving and augmenting these populations that there wouldn't necessarily be that need for natural flow on the landscape um, for bears in these kind of connectivity zones. And so I wanted to just kind of put that plug in there that, you know, we, we understand that augmentation is part of the process, but that, you know, we do also want that natural kind of connectivity between these recovery zones. Well, thanks, Carrie. Uh, I think she wrote uh, an excellent letter. I think it's responsive to the hearing that they had and responsive to the uh, proposed rule change. And it would put the, the tribes on record, um, particularly as, as grizzly bear managers, uh, um, the position of what, what the tribes think with this listing. It's, it's a small thing uh, to account for hunting as part of bear mortality, but it, it is part of a larger process, which is going to occur, which is the review to potentially delist. Uh, as the council's aware, they did this with the uh, greater Yellowstone population. Uh, ultimately, uh, the tribe submitted uh, a position that it was biologically warranted, but opposed delisting because it allowed for uh, sport hunting of grizzly bears. That could be where, where we go here. It would be up to Kerry and, and the other experts about whether it's biologically warranted, but uh, this is part of a larger, of a larger um, process. So um, for now, uh, it's, it's, it's advisable to uh, submit some comments uh, and Carrie put together a, a, a great sheet here. And um, so we're, we're looking for a consensus to submit this. Uh, it's, it's due on, on Friday. Thank you, John and Carrie. Um, Martin. I, I was gonna make a motion, but I think we're just gonna do it by consensus. So I'll hold off on that. Is it the consensus of the council to proceed with the letter? It looks like we have full consensus. I uh, applaud you on making sure that we have this opportunity to voice comments whenever possible. It just makes our record clearer. We can fall back on it. Um, really appreciate it. You know, for council, one of the things that was changed under this administration is that um, grizzly bears can be taken. Uh, if they're threatening your property or person any time now. So, and, and the word threatening was never defined really. And so what you have before you today is, is in some regards on private property, open season on grizzly bears. So with that in consideration, along with anything else, they introduce sport hunting, um, it's, it's, we have dramatic effects on, on, uh, on wildlife. The other thing is, is that the other expanded opportunities they did for taking of wolves and other uh, delisted type of a species. Um, there's added conflict in, in uh, um, depredation on grizzly bears with that action too. So the grizzly bears are going to be taking hits or looking at taking hits in a lot of different regards. So with that, uh, a letter like this is very important. So um, who, uh, Anita? I just had a quick comment and maybe Kerry can help us along with this, but a couple of years ago at our intertribal ag conference up in Paulson, we had some Blackfeet tribal members that were there and they were talking then about delisting. And of course, different places have different issues. You know, I don't think we have half as much problems as they have with the grizzly bear. They talked then about having three strikes and you're out, but you know, their plea was how much are they destroying before that third time and are you getting the right bear? But, you know, they definitely had a lot different opinion than what we would have here. But I was just wondering if you guys had talked with the other tribes because it's good. it seems like it's going to be hard if they do push it through. Um, how are you going to 
manage, you know, from fee property to trust, they, they have no idea, so. Yeah, and you're good, good question. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of the um, issues are driven by people that haven't had bear restored to their property. And so their, their conflicts are not used to. So one of the advantages of our reservation is that we've been managing and living with bears since forever. And so we've had this cohabitation ability to live with bears better. And so when the bears expand their habitat into, uh, you know, beyond the Rocky Mountain front and out into central Montana, then we end up with a, a lot of new conflict. People just don't know how to, how to, you know, operate their, their farming and ranching in, in lesser conflict with the grizzly bears on the landscape. So a lot of it is just really a lot of educational information that can, can behoove everybody in bear management. So, um, but there's a lot of tools in the tool bag for administrators and managers like Carrie to be able to deal with conflict and work with landowners. And that's what, that's what they always strive for first. Yeah, Anita. I was just gonna say also down in Moise and I certainly don't agree with it, but somehow I believe the sows were killed with the head cubs and two of them ended up getting destroyed, two or three, and the others went to a zoo that was in the paper here a couple months ago about the bear. But, you know, they didn't come back this year and they, they come down there and they get in that corn, you know, before it's harvested, you know, so it's a nice little feast, but, um, However, two of them were, were found dead, but I did not see them this year at all down there, so. Thank you for that information. Any other uh, discussions for Carrie or John on this topic? We will, uh, I'll sign the letter and we'll get it out. Thank you. Great, and I, I can work with Jen to, to get it out. I can upload it to the uh, commission portal. Um, if Jen doesn't or Abby doesn't mind getting it you know, formatted and, and, and signed and just give me a PDF and I'll copy uh, carry in as well. And we'll get it. We'll get those comments in this week and then we'll be, we'll be on the record. So I uh, appreciate uh, Carrie's awesome work too, because she's had to scramble a bit to, you know, get this done, but uh, thanks council. Appreciate it. Thank you guys very much for your time. Okay. Thanks, John Kerry. Um, Next, uh, Mr. Chairman and Council, we have uh, Mary with a request for a letter of support from Montana Trout Unlimited. Mary? Uh, yes, good morning, Tribal Council. And I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, I was receiving some last minute comments on this letter, and so it was not included in your packet. Um, so what this is, um, what, what I'm requesting is Tribal Council uh, approval to submit this letter to Montana Trout Unlimited. This is a letter of support uh, for uh, Montana Trout Unlimited's application for EPA Columbia River Basin Restoration Funding Assistance. Um, this um, application is um, directly related to the tribe's work around the Smurfit site and Superfund issues in the Clark Fork River. Uh, the applicant would be MTU. Uh, they have been working with the tribes, Fish, Wife and Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks and the Montana Natural Resources Damages Program who are all trustees to the Smurfit site uh, on developing their proposal. And what they wanna do is monitor fish update the fish consumption advisory that's in place for the Clark Fork River, and then undertake an education and outreach uh, campaign to educate the public about what, uh, you know, the risks, uh, what the toxins are that are appearing in fish tissue and what the human health risks are. So, um, again, um, I, I highlighted a few key um, points here since you haven't had an opportunity to read the uh, letter. Uh, but again, the tribes are a federal, federally recognized natural re resources trustee. And so again, this is part of our larger work around uh, the, the Smurfit site and the other Superfund sites on the Clark Fork River. 
So the issue is, is that the, um, you know, we're, this letter focuses on the fish consumption advisory because uh, one of the issues that we've been engaging with EPA about on the Smurfit site is the um, risk to tribal, uh, what we call tribal subsistence fishers from consuming fish taken from the Clark Fork River that are contaminated with dioxins, furans, and PCBs. Uh, potentially being released from, released from the Smurfit site. Um, and so uh, the point we've been trying to make with EPA is that uh, the fish consumption advisory that the state has put in place in, in response to that issue is geared more to a recreational fisher. It doesn't take into consideration, um, you know, the uniqueness of uh, tribal subsistence dietary practices that often include uh, consumption of the whole fish. The state's fish consumption guidelines only look at consumption of a filet. Um, and they also don't consider cumulative exposures from contaminated sediments, water, or soil. So potentially those fish consumption advisories are not truly representative of the human health risk. So part of this um, proposal would collect additional fish tissue samples to better understand where the toxins are coming from and how they're accumulating in fish tissue, and then use that data to update and better refine the fish consumption advisory. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean the, the advisory would be lessened. It could very well go up into a more stringent recommendation. Um, so part of the, um, one of the issues that EPA looks at when considering their, these applications is from the environmental justice perspective. And particularly with the point we wanna make here is that tribal populations are disproportionately affected due to their unique environmental exposures, both from greater fish consumption rates and dietary practices. The other point we wanna make is that this project, should it be funded, would build upon uh, work that the tribes are doing on this issue uh, in the Clark Fork River related to the Smurfit site and the upper Clark Fork River Superfund sites, but also on Flathead Lake uh, where the UN Biological Station and the Tribal Fisheries Program um, partnered on uh, an application that looked at, uh, among other things, um, tribal, uh, tribal members who are patrons of fish pantries that um, receive uh, lake trout that are culled from Flathead Lake. You know, what is uh, looking at what their potential risk might be to exposure from methyl mercury that is in Flathead Lake, um, and particularly for women of childbearing age, nursing mothers and children. These are all very high risk um, demographic groups. Um, so uh, in addition to the tribal, the CSKT tribal member population, I looked at the 2020 decennial census and um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a large Native American and Alaska Native population in, in Montana, um, approximately almost 8,000 on the Flathead Reservation and 3,300 in Missoula, in the Missoula area. And, and these numbers are not adjusted for geographic overlap, but it just demonstrates that there's a large number of individuals that are vulnerable. And we want to work with tr uh, Montana Trout Unlimited to um, help them develop a public outreach campaign that uh, is targeted to this population and then incorporates, uh, you know, the appropriate cultural messaging and, and content. Um, the other uh, part of the Trout Unlimited's proposal is that they want to partner with the tribes on implementing the plan. And the point I wanted to make here is that in addition to the STEM expertise, science, technology, engineering, and math, that the tribes are, would bring a, you know, a wealth of traditional ecological knowledge about the Clark Fork Basin to this effort. And you know, we 
I really like to stress that as a, an approach and a knowledge base that needs to be included in more of these studies. So, um, so in conclusion, uh, if the Tribal Council approves of this, um, uh, we would send this letter to Trout Unlimited and uh, this would be part of the application package that goes to EPA. And a lot of this is to, the way I wrote the letter is to also just remind EPA of these issues that we're engaging with them about and also to uh, inform Trout Unlimited because we have not worked with them on a project like this uh, before. And so this would just be a way to you know, bring the tribe's issues to their attention right from the beginning. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you, Mary. Any uh, questions for Mary and the letter? I can say that Trout Unlimited has been a great um, advocate for the tribes. Uh, we've partnered in other realms, of course, with them. And um, more recently, the uh, Rattlesnake Creek uh, restoration project and removing the uh, the dam down there. So it's been uh, it's been a great working relationship. I'm certainly uh, working them in a positive manner would would be a would be a, a great thing in the future in regards to this consumption study. So any questions for the I guess we would seek concession consensus for sending off the letter. Any questions for Mary? Consensus of Council to support the uh, trial limited project with the letter looks like we have a I have agreement we can uh, we'll support their grant application EPA and support with the support letter thank you Mary thank you tribal council thanks Mary uh that wraps it up for open session Mr. Chairman at this point we'd request executive session for a remaining